Today I'm going to be doing another book review and today's book is The Atlas of Perfumed Botany by Jean-Claude Elena. So this book is a pretty recently released perfumery book, only released last year in 2022, and it's a new book by Jean-Claude Elena, who is my favorite perfumer. Now, if you've been watching this channel in the past, you will probably have seen me recommend his other book all the time. So that other book which I always recommend is Perfume, The Alchemy of Scent. And the reason that I like this book so much is I think it serves as a really good introduction for someone who's interested in perfumery and it talks a lot about raw materials and even touches on how to make accords and things like that. So this book I couldn't recommend more and I actually did a full video review of that book so if you haven't already watched that then do think about checking that out. But today's video is all about this new book by him, The Atlas of Perfumed Botany. So, this book, what essentially is it? Whereas the other book was a bit more of an all-encompassing introduction to perfumery, this book is really kind of what it says in the tin. It's an atlas of perfume botany, meaning that it's essentially a book with a different page on each type of plant, and all the plants featured are those used in perfume. Now, it's coming at it from a perfumer's point of view. It's not talking just about the plants in the book. It does talk about the different plants, things like lavender, roses, jasmine, oak moss. It does talk a little bit about where they're found in the world, what the plant looks like, how they're grown, cultivated, that kind of thing. But then often it also goes on to talk about the uses of those plants in perfumes or Jean-Claude Elena's own thoughts as a perfumer on how he conceives those raw materials or the raw materials of from those plants and how he thinks about them or likes to use them in his perfumes or even just notes about how they're used in other famous perfumes. So when you open up the book it's essentially split up by the different uh, types or part of the plant which the raw material comes from. So at the beginning you've got woods and barks so you've got sandalwood, cinnamons, red cedar and oak moss. Then you've got the leaves so things like labdanum, absinthe, basil, rose, geranium, patchouli, violet. Then you've got flowers, jasmine, lavender, mimosa, narcissus, bitter orange, tea olive, rose, tuberose, and yang yang. Then we go to the fruits, and unlike what you might expect for there to be lots of different fruits like apples and bananas, you don't actually derive raw materials from a lot of those fruits in perfumery. So he's stuck to the few fruits where you actually can obtain a raw material, and most of those are citrus fruits. So under fruits we have bergamot, lemon, sweet orange, and he's also thrown in blackcurrant buds, which is quite interesting. And it turns out you actually use the leaves from the blackcurrant in order to get the absolute, which you can use in perfume. Then you've got gums and resins, so things like benzoin, galbanum, and myrrh and frankincense. He covers seeds, that's ambrette, green cardamom, carrot, nutmeg, mace, pepper, tonka, and vanilla. And then finally, some roots, so garden angelica, iris, and vetiver. So that list isn't that long, but those are all of the raw materials he covers. And all of those raw materials have been selected, mostly due to their widespread use in perfumery and the fact that he has a lot of interesting stuff to write about them. So in the book, you will learn things about, for example, where in the world those plants are cultivated, and sometimes even goes into the history, for example, of which empires uh, found the plants and then which empires kind of took over or traded them elsewhere in the world and then which perfumers started to use them and why, that kind of thing. So you really do find quite interesting information Whereas it's not always directly helpful in the perfumery, it is quite interesting to have that kind of historical context and it helps you understand a bit about how those raw materials came to be used in traditional perfumes. Now, one thing that really stands out about the book is for someone like you or me, um, someone who's making perfume at home or someone who's not necessarily trained professionally by the industry, what this book really does is it gives you a glimpse into the life of a professional perfumer. And this book takes you on a journey all the way from Jean-Claude's early days when he worked in the raw materials production facilities uh, doing things like extracting oak moss or patchouli in massive vats and what it's like to do that. And then he goes and talks about the different methods of harvest for different things. For example, how uh, tuberose is different from jasmine, even though both are having the flowers picked and then extracted. And then you also get to know just a lot of other little kind of journeys and things that might happen inside a perfumer's day-to-day -day life. He goes 
to tell a lot of different stories. For example, what it's like um, meeting a bergamot producer in Italy, going to their farm, or what it's like doing a collaboration with a Michelin star chef um, between both a perfume and a food and them trying to come up with something together. Now, this book does focus on natural raw materials and perfumery, but it does also briefly mention some synthetics. For example, when it goes to talk about cinnamon, it goes to talk about the two different varieties, both the traditional Celian cinnamon and also the Chinese-grown cassia cinnamon. And he talks, for example, about how generally the taste in the USA is a bit preferential towards the cheaper cassia cinnamon, which has a more intense flavor. And he goes on to say that's due to it having more benzaldehyde and cinnamic aldehyde. So these two aromachemicals, which are key to differentiating the taste. And as you may know, taste and smell are very closely linked. So this can start to give you some ideas as a perfumer, for example, if you had a cinnamon note, how, and it was quite generic for example, how might you want to go and bend it towards more of a cassia cinnamon? You could go and add those two things. Or knowing about those two aroma chemicals, say you wanted to kind of imply cinnamon but in a sweeter sense without the kind of more depthy, complex, uh, drier, woody notes to it, you just wanted to add the sweet, more almond-like notes, then maybe you just use benzaldehyde and a little touch of cinnamic aldehyde to imply cinnamon without even using any cinnamon itself. So he's not actually giving you kind of direct tips for perfumery, telling you add this to that or make some formulas, but nevertheless there are some little snippets of information which can serve to provide inspiration. I picked out a few of my favorite uh, of these snippets of information. I thought I would include them in this video just so that even if you don't get a chance to go and read the book for yourself, then you can still get some value from it which will help you in your own perfumery. For example, one of the things he says is in an amber accord, apparently it's the vanillin which is really the major component and you're only actually meant to add a touch of labdanum absolute to the amber accord, which is something that I didn't know before. I actually think I assumed in the past that you would add more labdanum because it's not quite as strong. Another thing which I think is really cool is he used galbanum in combination with mandarin to create a tomato accord in one of his perfumes for the brand Sizzly. Now, I really like the smell of tomatoes and or tomato leaves at least and I've never really managed to make that accord well myself so this is a good idea that I might go and try at some point. Another thing he says is if you go and combine myrrh, anise and mint you get the flavour or the smell of what's called a zan candy. I haven't heard of this myself so if you've heard of it do let me know in the comments but apparently it's some kind of traditional French candy. And then he says frankincense and lavender are quite a good combination together. And he also says that in his perfume for Hermes called Epice Marine, he used cardamom, cinnamon, cumin, bergamot and algonone, which is a synthetic molecule. And those essentially form the character or the heart accord of that perfume. So again, it's not really anything crazy helpful in general for perfumery, but it's got these little ideas which might be fun to try. I don't actually have any algonone myself, but maybe I could try mixing those other things together and put something else instead, like some adoxal or calone or some kind of other aquatic or marine type molecule. When talking about carrot seed oil, which is something that I had in the past and I really hated it, though I think the one I had was very low quality. So I'd be interested to see what a high quality carrot seed oil smells like. But when talking about carrot seed oil in the book, he says this combined with a bit of blackcurrant bud absolute actually gives a pretty good accord for mango, which is one of my favorite smells. So again, this is something that I should probably try at some point. Another one that I found which might be interesting to some of you guys who actually like uh, existing perfumes on the market is if you've heard of the perfume Opium, then apparently the main or one of the key accords in the perfume Opium is that between nutmeg, clove, cinnamon and vanilla. So if you like that kind of perfume, then why not try adding those four ingredients or those four materials together and just see what happens. So in summary, do I think this book is a good book and do I think it's for you? Well, is it a good book? I think it's a pretty good book and here are the reasons why. Firstly, it's not too expensive, so that means that I guess the bar for what I would consider it to be a good book is not too high, as in as long as it's pretty decent and I'm not paying too much, then that's, that's good. But I do think the book itself is pretty good and it's pretty decent. So firstly, you've got a lot of nice illustrations inside of the book, which just gives it a nice feel. 
Um, but actually the information inside it I think was quite interesting. It's a really good read and both from the point of view as a perfumer, someone looking for little bits of inspiration, I found some little things in there which I think is good. I mean, it's definitely something that you don't find that often in books. There aren't many books about perfumery or those which might have little bits that you could use. So for me, already that was probably worth the price of the book, even though nothing was absolutely crazy. But then aside from that, just as someone not necessarily interested in perfumery, I still think it's a really nice book. It's a really nice book maybe to have on your coffee table because you've got all of these little bite-sized kind of double page spreads about a certain raw material. Anyone could just pick up this book and flick through around the page, start reading it and find it really, really interesting. So I think it's a really good book pretty much all around. And no matter if you're interested in both natural and synthetic raw materials, or if you're only interested in natural perfumery, again, because the book mostly focuses on naturals, it doesn't really matter who you are, you'll probably find it quite interesting. Now, the other question, is this book for you and should you buy it? Now, for someone who kind of has already been doing perfumery for a while, maybe you already know the basics. Um, if you're just looking for these extra little snippets of information, then I think that is one good reason to buy it. And that's certainly why that I found the book especially enjoyable to read. Um, secondly, if you're interested in perfumery but don't actually make perfume or you haven't tried it yourself or you're not necessarily even planning on going to do it but nonetheless you like perfumes and you want to learn a bit more about it, then this book would be absolutely fantastic because it's written in that way where it's just got a lot of history and stories and kind of details and things about plants. It's very nicely written with just not much technical stuff at all but you still feel like you're kind of learning something. If you are a beginner into perfumery, then it depends what you're looking for. Because if you're looking for a book which is going to teach you perfumery and teach you how to make perfumes, then I wouldn't actually recommend this book. You'd be much better off with his other book, Perfume the Alchemy of Scent, because at least with that, it actually goes into a bit more technical detail in kind of a bite-sized way that allows you to go and learn more kind of fundamental little things in perfumery. But on the other hand, if you're a beginner and you're just kind of getting into the world and you're more interested in maybe the more um, creative approach and you just want to know a bit more about the origins of some of these natural raw materials and their context and history and in perfume, then this book, I think, would be really good. So there you have it. That's my review of The Atlas of Perfume Botany by Jean-Claude Elena. Now, do let me know what you thought of this video in the comments, if you liked it or what other videos you would like to see. And apart from that, good luck with all of your perfumery and I'll see you with another video very soon. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description.